debate on up to 142 amendments. The bill authorizing nearly $643 billion for 2013 defense programs and includes $88.5 billion for the war in Afghanistan. Also, we expect debate on a couple of procedural motions to the conference report on the transportation bill. And now to live coverage of the U.S. House here on C-SPAN. The House will be in order. The prayer will be offered uh, today by Reverend Ken Croninger, uh, Alfred Station Seventh Day Baptist Church, Alfred Station, New York. Heavenly Father, in this moment we wait on you. We take a deep breath and try stopping the rush and the hurry of life. For an instant, we ask you to lift the weight of government and the burden of our role in it from our hearts, minds, and souls. We accept what we read. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. With the pressures of living in the house fishbowl, give grace and mercy to receive favors limit mistakes made simply because we are human. Like those who have proceeded within these chambers, give wisdom to govern. Fill us with faith and hope that what we do here is not running on a treadmill, but encouragingly touching the lives of the people at home. Teach us as we serve to care for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman, gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If all could join. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Uh, without objection, uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to welcome to the House chamber a great individual from our district, Pastor Ken Croninger. Croninger. Pastor Ken is the spiritual leader of 70 in my district in Alfred Station, New York, for the Seventh-day Baptist Church there. It's an honor to have Pastor Ken here with us. I have great respect for Pastor Ken, not only for what he does for his congregation, but what he does for the community, in particular, the baseball games that we have attended together for the youth as they have participated in their summer leagues in Alfred Station. So with that, Speaker, I welcome Pastor Ken as we, from the southern tier and the Finger Lakes, the beautiful area of New York, join him in starting off our deliberations here today. And with that, I yield back. Chair will receive a message. Madam Speaker, a message from the President of the United States. Madam Speaker. Mr. Secretary. I am directed by the President of the United States to deliver to the House of Representatives a message in writing. The Chair will entertain 15 further requests for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, for the past 39 months, our nation's unemployment rate has remained above 8 percent due to the administration's failed policies. Sadly, the average unemployment rate for our veterans is even higher. Congress has developed a pilot program to help veterans find jobs. Veterans should be prepared to simultaneously meet the same standards and perform the same task in the military and industry as the workplace. In order to address this issue, Congressman Joe Walsh of Illinois has proposed an amendment for today's National Defense Authorization Act, providing for the Department of Defense to reform the pilot program, helping service members apply the skills learned during their military service to the civilian workplace. 
I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment for service members, military families, and veterans. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we'll never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. For what purpose does a gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? Gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today to join the people of Nagorno-Karabakh in recognizing the 20th anniversary of the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh and the formation of the Republic's army. Twenty years ago, the people of Nagorno-Karabakh fought and died for their independence from Soviet Azeri repression and discrimination. From the earliest days of its formation, the Republic's freely elected governmental bodies have built an open democratic society through free and transparent elections. Over the next few days, families of Armenian descent throughout my home state of Rhode Island will honor the 20th anniversary of the formation of the Republic's army and the liberation of Shushi. Today, the Rhode Island General Assembly will be joined by Mr. Robert Avatizian, the permanent representative of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic to the United States as they adopt a resolution supporting the Republic's effort to develop as a free and independent nation, a fact that many Rhode Islanders take great pride in. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Gentleman is recognized. Well, Madam Speaker, it was nearly 200 years ago that the people of Norway proclaimed their independence as a free nation. And each year on May 17th, Norwegians all over the world celebrate the day that their constitution was signed with parades, traditional food, and other festivities. Madam Speaker, the United States and Norway have a very special bond. Our traditions of human rights and freedom and also uh, uh, democracy are woven in the very fabric of our shared history. And over the last two centuries, the people of Norway have contributed greatly to the success and prosperity of our global community. As co-chair of the House Friends of Norway Caucus, I'd like to send our best wishes to the people of Norway as they celebrate this year's Set in Amai today and reaffirm the friendship between our two nations as we work together on important issues ahead. I yield back. The purpose of the gentlelady from California rise. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last October, on the 10th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan, I visited Arlington West, a moving memorial to Americans who have died in that war. Every Sunday on the sands of Santa Monica Beach, volunteers put up a cross for every soldier who's lost their life in that war. As the number of dead grew, they were only able to put one cross for every 10 soldiers. 1,843 U.S. soldiers have lost their lives in Afghanistan. We've had 17,000 casualties. And the defense bill today, in its current form, slows down the effort to withdraw our troops when we should be speeding it up. That's why I've co-sponsored legislation with Barbara Lee that would mandate that any Afghanistan funding be used only to bring our troops home. Without such a change, I can't vote for this bill. I don't want to go back to Arlington West only to see them adding more crosses. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Uh, gentleman is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, there are no uh, greater reminders of how dangerous Iran is to America than the Iranian-backed 1983 Beirut and 1996 Kobar Towers bombing, where 260 Americans lost their lives. There was no military or economic retaliation towards Iran for their involvement in these bombings. The only type of recourse the families of those who died have had is a financial award given to them by the federal courts, an award that has not been seen. This is why I've introduced H.R. 4070, a legal necessity which revokes sovereign immunity from Iranian central bank and allows a federal court to attach frozen funds. Thus, the families who are impacted by those uh, bombings can receive the financial compensation they deserved and were previously awarded. Today, 15 family members who lost their loved ones are on Capitol Hill asking for two things, that we do everything we can to prevent Iran from killing more Americans, and that we hold them accountable for their actions. So, I would like to say that I stand with them and will continue to remind Americans about what the Iran has done and what they continue to do. Thank you. For purposes of the gentleman from Ohio, rise. The gentleman is recognized. The NDAA authorizes war against Iran. 
It calls for a new policy, military action, which puts U.S. aircraft and munitions into position for air and sea-based missions, and the bolstering of U.S. capabilities to launch a sustained sea and air campaign against a range of Iranian nuclear and military targets. It authorizes war under the pretext that Iran is threatening to launch a nuclear attack, even though Iran does not have nuclear weapons, does not have nuclear weapons capability, and is not building a bomb. Beyond the obvious political and military questions here, there is a profound spiritual question. What is happening to the spirit of America that we can embrace war or waging war so casually? What happens to our souls when we authorize an attack on a nuclear facility in another country? What happens to the souls of those who perish when radiation is released from such an attack? The Golden Rule states, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It does not say, do unto others before they do unto you. For what purpose does the gentlelady from South Dakota rise? Uh, the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honor the memory of former South Dakota Congressman and U.S. Senator Jim Abner, who passed away yesterday at the age of 89. Jim Abner dedicated his life to serving the state of South Dakota and our country. In whatever capacity he was serving, as Lieutenant Governor, as Congressman, U.S. Senator, uh, even Administrator of the United States uh, Small Business Administration, Jim was a man that constantly put others first. South Dakotans who knew him remember Jim as an incredibly decent man who worked tirelessly for the state that he loved. In my personal interactions with Jim, I was always impressed by what a man of humility and integrity that he was. A born and raised South Dakotan, he left a legacy of hard work, commitment, and selfless sacrifice that every resident of the Rushmore State can be proud of. I ask the South Dakotans and all those who knew him personally or of his legacy to keep his family and loved ones in their thoughts and prayers. And with that, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Ohio seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I rise on behalf of the millions of veterans who have returned home from Iraq and Afghanistan. From joblessness to hopelessness, the readjustment to civilian life has been extremely difficult for, most of, for many of our brave men and women. It is our responsibility to do all we can to lighten their already heavy load. Today, my colleagues and I sent a letter to the Education and Workforce Committee urging Chairman Klein to address the aggressive and deceptive targeting of service members, veterans, and their families by educational institutions, particularly for profit career colleges. I've read reports of schools steering our vets and their family members into expensive loans rather than directing them to less expensive federal student loans. This is egregious and appalling, and it must be stopped. Join me in calling for hearings and for the movement of legislation. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I'd like to invite America to join me in celebrating a belated birthday party in Frederick County, Maryland. Just 100 years ago, on the 22nd of last month, William Howard Taft convened 700 business leaders in the United States, and they established the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Just one day later, through the miracle of communication by wire, delegates from Frederick County are asked to be chartered as the first county chamber of commerce in the United States. Please join me in celebrating this very important uh, belated birthday, 100th birthday celebration in Frederick County, Maryland. Thank you so much, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, investing in education is an investment in our nation's future. In these tough times, we should make every effort to increase access to higher education for all Americans, and I state for all Americans. Unfortunately, if Congress does not act soon, interest rates on student loans will double for over 7 million students. If these rates hikes go into effect, it will be cheaper to buy a home than to buy a college education. Sadly, the GOP seems to want higher education reserved only for the wealthiest Americans. Instead of working to help more Americans achieve a college education, Republicans are playing games with the health of women and children. Once again, Republicans are showing the priorities are out of touch with hardworking Americans. 
We need to act now to keep student loans interest rates low so all Americans, I say, so all Americans have an opportunity to obtain an education. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Permission to address the House for one minute. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honor and thank Lieutenant Colonel David Arnett from Greeley, Colorado, for his 29 years of service in the United States Air Force. Colonel Arnett, Colonel Arnett retired from service as the flight commander of the 137th Space Warning Squadron in Greeley this past month. His extensive accomplishments in the United States Air Force are rivaled only by his service and involvement in the Greeley community. Colonel Arnett was recognized for his outstanding performance as a combat field commander, and the 137th Space Warning Squadron was recognized as the nation's top non-flying Air National Guard combat squadron six times, which is unprecedented. After 16 years of service in Greeley and a dozen major and minor combat inspections by the United States Air Force, Colonel Arnett was additionally recognized as one of the nation's top space and missile operators and flight commanders. In the Greeley community, Colonel Arnett was the Boy Scouts of America Scoutmaster of the Year and is a loving husband to his wife, Cindy, and father of their four children. Today, I would like to formally honor and congratulate Colonel Arnett on his retirement and thank him for his service and commitment to our nation. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in recognition of May as National Cancer Research Month. We have made many promising advances in cancer research, including at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in my Buffalo community. Beyond traditional chemotherapy, cancer research has produced new discoveries, including smart drugs and vaccines for both prevention and therapy. Mr. Speaker, the only failure in cancer research is when you quit or you're forced to quit because of lack of funding. Our budget should reflect our nation's priorities. We all say cancer research is a priority, but con Congress then cuts funding to the National Cancer Institute. I urge my colleagues in the strongest possible terms to make a strong investment in cancer research funding. Let's give our scientists and researchers the support that they need. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee rise? Gentlemen's, necessary. gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Glenn Campbell is one of the great singers and guitarists in our United States history. He suffers from Alzheimer's disease. Despite that fact, he continues to tour, and he's giving his farewell tour now. Last night, some of us were privileged to hear him at the Library of Congress, and still performing well. He's performing to bring more attention to Alzheimer's, a disease that strikes 5 million Americans and will strike another 10 million as baby boomers get older. A serious disease which has no cure and no real knowledge of the origins of it. We must find a cure. President Obama announced the launch of the National Alzheimer's Plan, which is hopefully going to find a cure and prevent and treat Alzheimer's by 2025. We need to support the appropriations for such in this body, support Francis Collins and the National Institute of Health, and we need to support the caregivers who have treat the Alzheimer's victims. It is an urgent problem that we must deal with today. I thank Glenn Campbell for his courage in performing and bringing more attention of the American people and the world to this terrible illness. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon rise? The gentleman's recognized. On July 1st, uh, student interest rates are set to double uh, on their loans from 3.4 to 6.8 percent. Now, after initially resisting uh, making any adjustment and proposing actually further cuts in student financial aid, the Republicans said, oh, no, okay, wait a minute, we'll bring up a bill. We'll take care of that for one year. You just have to eliminate funding for public health and preventative health care. Student loans or preventative health care and public health. They say that's a choice we have to make. We don't have to make that choice. There's a much better choice. If we raised taxes 1% on income over $380,000 a year, their taxes would still be lower than in the Clinton era, and we could fund a permanent reduction in financial aids for students. Now, I know at the country club they're not hearing much about people who can't afford to go to college. But I tell you what, 
for the people in my district and the people I represent. Their kids are loading up with debt, and it's going to hobble them after they graduate from college. We've got to reduce these rates. We've got to reduce them permanently. And why not ask those who've made it fabulously and earn over $380,000 a year to contribute 1% to that cause? Does the gentlelady from North Carolina seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized. I rise to today in support of the supply chain security language that Representative Turner included in the Strategic Forces Subcommittee section of the National Defense Authorization Act. Information technology procurement and supply chain management continue to be a challenge for both the private sector and the federal government. Congress must continue to ensure that those entities have the resources and legal authority necessary to prevent certain companies from inserting potentially malicious equipment into various supply chains. The threats amplify when our public and private sectors consider Chinese state-owned and government-affiliated telecommunication companies as potential business partners. I would like to submit an article into the record, Ms. Madam Speaker, that demonstrates a recent concern for the ZTA Corporation. Without ZTA objection. is a Chinese state-owned and operated company. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in honor of Older Americans Month. And I want to address an issue that is incredibly important to seniors, that is caring for seniors with chronic illness and preventing unnecessary hospitalizations. Madam Speaker, skilled home care providers in my district deliver high quality and clinically effective care. And such care enables seniors to stay in their homes rather than costing us by putting them um, out of their homes and into uh, nursing homes. Unfortunately, a narrow sliver of operators within the Medicare home health program are tarnishing the good work of these dedicated, compassionate, and skilled professionals. MedPAC has found that a small number of criminals in just 25 counties are ripping off Medicare beneficiaries and taxpayers. And since we know the source of this abuse, it makes the most sense to isolate it and to go after it, rather than indiscriminately cutting payments to thousands of home care providers that do the right thing by seniors and taxpayers. So let's reform the way we do this. Let's not cut off the people who do good work. The gentlelady from, what, for what purpose is the gentlelady from Maryland rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to honor the 45th anniversary of the dedication of the Crossland Vocational Center located in Prince George's County, Maryland. On April 27, 1967, President Lyndon Johnson dedicated the Crossland Vocational Center at Crossland High School in Maryland. President Johnson, as he landed his helicopter on what is now known as Presidential Field, used the dedication to mark the 50th anniversary of the Smith Hughes Act of 1917, which provided federal support for vocational schools and helped separate boards for vocational education. President Johnson stated, once we considered education a public expense, we now know it's a public investment. I couldn't agree more. The world we live in has never been more competitive, and other countries are making investments in their infrastructure, space agencies, and task, task codes. We must do the same. We must have an education system that prepares our children for the success in the 21st century. And we must do this with our community colleges and in conjunction with building and trade unions, beginning at vocational schools like Crossland Vocational Center. From President Johnson's vision in 1967 to President Obama's commitment today, we have the future. Thank you, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The original Violence Against Women's Act was championed by then Senator Joe Biden, who understood that all women must be protected from domestic abuse and other violence. He understood that many women are afraid to come forward to report abuse. The Violence Against Women Act gave women a better chance to live their lives without that fear. Again, the Senate has taken the lead. They already reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act and did it in a way that protects all women. It does not discriminate. It promises women will, that America will stand by women. We will protect women. We will prosecute their abusers. 
The Republican bill that barely passed this House yesterday breaks our solemn promise. I call on leadership to allow a fair up or down vote on the Real Violence Against Women's Act and not some watered down, weakened version. We owe it to our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, our friends, and to the memory of those we have lost to abuse. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have begun the debate on the NDAA, and we all know that this is the legislation that's going to set forth our policy where it comes to the military for this upcoming fiscal year. You've heard some of my colleagues and how they feel about portions of the NDAA, all points well taken. But I ask that we look at it from a different perspective. Let us look at the NDAA in light of what the President said in November of 2012. When he addressed APEC, he said the 21st century is for the Pacific, and we are pivoting to the Asia Pacific. And what does that mean? He went on to say how the 21st century does and how it's defined, whether one in conflict or one in controversy, is going to be determined by the Asia Pacific region. So what is it that we need in the Asia Pacific region? We need our allies and trade partners to feel safe and confident. And guess what? They look to our military for that. That is also something that the NDAA critically addresses. How the military is for the 21st century and our peace in the Pacific will be determined by them. Thank you, Madam Chair. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise today with great concern over our defense budget. Our crushing debt looms, and yet we continue to ignore the issue. The National Defense Authorization came in at $8 billion over the Budget Control Act because the committee put back high-cost items that the Pentagon had not listed as their highest priority. How is that responsible spending? When the issue arises as to what to cut, what must make up that difference to make the numbers work, what will come first? Will our military personnel accounts be under the knife? I do not believe that that is smart legislating when we choose to ignore the current fiscal environment. And when we raise concerns on the plans to build a missile defense site on the East Coast with money we do not have, the Rules Committee would not even allow it up for debate. Shouldn't we be discussing these issues so that we can move forward, that we can come to an agreement on how the Department of Defense and our service members are best served? I yield back my time. Thank For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? And the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, it seems like Groundhog Day all over again. Earlier this week, GOP leaders, leaders laid down a new gambit on the old debate over whether to acknowledge our nation's financial obligations. Those leaders have already abandoned the deal we made on the last debt ceiling package and are shifting all the cuts to education, infrastructure, and other vital domestic programs. Now they want another round of unsustainable cuts to these programs, which will again bring us back to the brink of default. We know the possible consequences, market collapse, Jobs lost, more than a trillion dollars added to the deficit every year. Interest rates will rise. Just getting close to this cliff threatens the U.S. credit rating. We know that from recent experience. The Speaker has said that, no, he doesn't want to abandon the debt ceiling. He doesn't want to violate the debt ceiling. He doesn't want to, to let the country go into default. But isn't this the same kind of uncertainty that our Republican friends say they're most concerned about? One day it's well, we're going to not raise the debt ceiling the next day. No, I didn't mean that. We need certainty, we need stability, and we need to recognize this nation's obligations. Yield back. Chair lays before the House a message. To the Congress of the United States, Section 202D of the National Emergencies Act provides for the automatic termination of a national emergency unless 
Within 90 days prior to the anniversary date of its declaration, the President publishes in the Federal Register and transmits to the Congress a notice stating that the emergency is to continue in effect beyond the anniversary date. In, accord in accordance with this provision, I have sent to the Federal Register a publication the enclosed notice stating that the national emergency with respect to Burma that, they declared, that was declared on May 20, 1997 is to continue in effect beyond May 20, 2012. The Burmese government has made progress in a number of areas, including releasing hundreds of political prisoners, pursuing ceasefire talks with several armed ethnic groups, and pursuing a substantive dialogue with Burma's leading pro-democracy opposition party. The United States is committed to supporting Burma's reform effort, but the situation in Burma continues to pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. Burma has made important strides, but the political opening is nascent, and we continue to have concerns, including remaining political prisoners, ongoing conflict, and serious human rights abuses in ethnic areas. For this reason, I have determined that it is necessary to continue the national emergency with respect to Burma and to maintain and enforce the sanctions that respond to this threat, signed Barack Obama, the White House, May 17, 2012. Referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs and ordered printed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Utah seek recognition? Madam Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 661 and ask for its immediate consideration. And the clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 132, House Resolution 661, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of the Bill, H.R. 4310 to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2013 for military activities of the Department of Defense, to prescribe military personnel strengths for fiscal year 2013 and for other purposes. No further general debate shall be in order. Section 2A, in lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Armed Services now printed in the bill, it shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 112-22. That amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. All points of order against that amendment in the nature of a substitute are waived. B. No amendment to the amendment in the nature of, of a substitute made in order as original text shall be in order except those printed in the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution and amendments on block described in Section 3 of this resolution. C. Each amendment printed in the report of the Committee on Rules shall be considered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. D. All points of order against amendments printed in the report of the Committee on Rules or against amendments on block described in Section 3 of this resolution are waived. Section 3. It shall be in order at any time for the Chair of the Committee on Armed Services or his designee to offer amendments on block consisting of amendments printed in the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this this resolution not earlier disposed of. Amendments on block offered pursuant to this section shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Armed Services or their designees, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. The original proponent of an amendment included in such amendments on block may insert a statement in the Congressional record immediately before the disposition of any amendments on block. Section 4. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the Committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. Any member may demand a separate vote in the House on any amendment adopted in the Committee of the Whole to the bill or to the amendment in the nature of a substitute made in order as original text. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion 
except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut rise? Uh, Madam Speaker, thank you. I make a point of order against the consideration of the resolution. The resolution violates uh, Clause 9 of Rule 21 by waiving the rule against consideration of Amendment Number 1 by Mr. McKeon. The gentleman from Connecticut makes a point of order that the resolution violates Clause 9B of Rule 21. And under Clause 9B of Rule 21, the gentleman from Connecticut and the gentleman from Utah each will control 10 minutes of debate on the question of consideration. And following the debate, the chair will put the question of consideration as follows. Will the House now consider the resolution? The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I rise. Uh, uh, to speak on behalf of uh, so many families of our men and women in service who are in need of our help. I'm proud to be joined on the floor uh, this afternoon by my dear friend and colleague, um, Walter Jones. And I, I think, Madam Speaker, what we have here is just simply, uh, as a line from Cool Hand Luke, is a failure to communicate. And these things can happen. But I know that there are honorable people on both sides who are in agreement with the plight of what happens uh, to the Kenyan family that I have pictured here. I use this picture and rise on their behalf because these are constituents of mine who brought to my attention a concern that while men and women deployed in our armed services and in this case, Sergeant Major William Kendall deployed twice while his daughter, Rachel, deals with autism. Autism is near epidemic in this country. And for military families especially, when someone is abroad in the service of their country, it's hard enough when two parents are at home to deal with autism. It's even more complicated when a father or mother is away from their child. And so we heard from thousands of family members across this nation. And in the process, we learned how important this was. What they seek is applied behavior analysis, which unfortunately for them, there's a cap that's placed on this. Imagine you're the mother at home. This loving mother, Rachel, with her daughter, Rachel Margaret, with caps imposed on them, can't afford or can't get the service. This amendment is simple and straightforward and has been accepted uh, by the committee. And what happened in the process, and this is where I say that there is miscommunication, that when the agreed pay for was asked to be modified, it indeed was. But there was a miscommunication between rules and the committee. I know in my heart that not only Mr. Jones, Mr. Bishop, who is here, Mr. Sessions, who's part of the committee, and the caucus on autism, uh, the number of like-minded people in both caucuses care deeply about these results. As we approach Memorial Day, certainly we want the message to be to our men and women in the field, we know that we will leave no soldier behind on the battlefield. We also have to know that we will leave no child behind at home. Now this is a compelling case that the Kenyans make on behalf of all Americans, men and women who serve in our military, and one that has been underscored by my dear friend and his experience at Camp Lejeune, and I'd like to recognize uh, Walter Jones and yield him as one much minute. time. One minute. One minute to do. Uh, 
thank the gentleman from uh, Connecticut. And I want to say to both parties, he is exactly right. I have count the June Marine Base in my district. The last four years, I've met with two different times with Marine husbands and wives and the autism children. It is a serious problem. And as Mr. Larson has said, this was fixed. But somewhere along the way, the communications breaks, breaks down like it does too often here in Washington. And as Mr. Larson said, let's try to fix this problem today. Let's get it in the base bill. Let's send it over to the Senate on behalf of all of our men and women in uniform and the families who have children with autism. Please, God, let us, let us fix this for those families. And I yield back to the gentleman from Connecticut. I thank God. Uh my good friend, the gentleman from North Carolina, for his, his comments. Uh, this is a pretty remarkable family. And about uh, a month ago, I was in New York City on the Intrepid, where we heard from several military families, families in general, that are dealing with the issue of autism. So many like-minded people in this caucus uh, and, frankly, in this Congress understand the predicament uh, that the Kenyans face. Imagine Sergeant Major Kenyon having done two tours of duty in Afghanistan. I rise today on behalf of him and his daughter, who only ask of this Congress what I know everyone would like to deliver on. We can't let a miscommunication stand between their getting the relief that they and so many American families need. I would uh, hope, and I'm told through our process, that because, as the resolution was read, that because Chairman McKinnon has on-block capability, that we are able to work out something and have this amendment as it was intended, as it was agreed to in the process, and as the corrections were made that were asked of the majority so that it could be made in order and placed on block that this may occur for these, this family and the thousands others that are like them. I asked my colleague uh, from Utah, a man of great distinction, uh, and I don't know that he will use his uh, 10 minutes or that if we could enter into a colloquy as to how we might proceed on this. Are you yielding time to me? I would gladly yield time to you. For a colloquy? Sure. Would you like to start the colloquy? Because I really don't have the best answer for you right now. <laughs> well, it is my hope, uh, and I thank the gentleman, it's my hope and understanding that this may not be a remedy that can, we can have through the Rules Committee. And rather than put the body through a series of votes, uh, if we could work with the committee and the Committee of Cognizance, the Armed Services Committee. I know uh, that uh, Ranking Member Smith is here and uh, certainly uh, will work with and strive to uh, uh, correct this anomaly that has occurred. Uh, and uh, I believe that like-minded people on both sides of the aisle want to see this <coughs> succeed. Uh, if I, what I suggest, if the gentleman would reserve the balance of his time, let me say what I have to say about this particular issue, and then we can proceed from that point, if that's okay. I will withdraw the balance of my time. Just reserve it. Reserve the balance okay. of my time. Thank you. If, if I could deal with this, there's a couple of different levels in which we need to, to, uh, to respond. I have the utmost respect for the gentleman from Con uh, Connecticut as well as the gentleman from North Carolina on this issue. 
I have a great deal of empathy on this issue. There is, uh, there is the technical approach about which this rule deals, as well as the potential of how we can actually solve the problem, and those are two different concepts. I think you alluded to that fact. Correct. First one, as to the specifics of this, and as I would then, you know, obviously claim the time in favor of the consideration of the resolution. The, the question before the House is, should the House now consider House Resolution 661? And while the resolution waives all points of order against the amendment in the nature of substitute and the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report, the committee is not aware of any points of order and the, and the waivers are prophylactic in nature, which means Chairman McKeon has filed an earmarked statement regarding his manager's amendment and the statement we will read at some time in the future. There is the ability, though, of obviously trying to find a solution to a problem that has developed, whether it's from miscommunication or not. From my position as managing this particular rule, I cannot commit to that. But I, I am aware, and I'm sure that the committee is obviously recognizing the fact that we have multiple steps in which we go forward. The Senate still has to produce a piece of work, it has to go to a conference committee. At any of those steps along the way, there's the opportunity of trying to find a good solution to this particular issue. And though I cannot make a commitment on my part this time, I think we can talk about that in the future. And with that, Madam Speaker, I will reserve the balance of my time and see if you want to go any further with this. Gentleman reserves his time. Well, gentleman I, from Connecticut. I thank the uh, gentleman uh, from Utah, and I know that uh, uh, he is a man of great integrity and respect. And I understand the dilemma that he is, uh, that he is placed in in terms of the Rules Committee. Uh, it is my understanding and hope, and we will work with the Committee of, uh, of Cognizance uh, because we do think with uh, so many people having signed on to this bill and so many people watching and, and knowing that there was good faith agreements on all sides, and this is not about finger pointing or blame, it's about helping these kids out, and this is about helping these families out, and uh, I'm not here uh, to obstruct the process. You're right. Uh, I raised the point of order so I'd have an opportunity to talk about the Kenyans, not about the point of order. Uh, but that's the only tool that I had available to me. But I will continue to proceed uh, down the road. And I know that I will be joined by members on both sides. And uh, hopefully we can have the will of the House be known and not rely uh, on the Senate in, a pro in, in the process of conference. Gentleman from Utah. Allow me to yield one minute to the gentleman from Indiana. Gentleman from Indiana for one minute. When I was chairman of government reform and oversight, we had hearings for about two years on the autism issue. And while I'm not going to speak uh, on this, uh, this uh, particular motion, I, I would just like to say that it is a real tragedy that we're facing in this country. We used to have one in 10,000 people that were autistic kids, and now it's one in 88. It's an absolute epidemic, and there's really not much of a recourse for the parents. And these kids are going to live a normal life expectancy. And it's going to cost the taxpayers of this country and all the states a ton of money. And so we have to get, get a handle on this and get it as quickly as possible. So I appreciate the gentleman raising the issue. I'm not going to uh, be able to support his uh, position. But if I can work with you in any way to deal with this problem, I hope you'll contact me. Well, I, I thank the gentleman, and I believe that there will be a way Gentlemen's if we time's can expired. Uh, talk with uh, uh, Mr. Gentleman uh, from McKinney. Utah, the gentleman from Connecticut's time's expired. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, um, I am limited into the kinds of responses for which I have the opportunity to, to announce here. Once again, I appreciate the gentleman from Connecticut bringing this issue up. It is a significant issue. We have a great deal of empathy for this particular issue, and I am sure that as we go along through the process of this bill, this issue and some others may be, having, be able to be worked out in other venues. At this stage of the game, though, there are certain restrictions in which we have procedurally on what we can and cannot do with this particular issue. And this issue, as I said, uh, has had the statement by, President, by uh, Chairman McKean as to the amendments. His, his statement was simply as follows. The amendment to be offered by Representative McKean to H.R. 4310 and the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2003 does not contain any congressional earmarks, limited tax benefits, or ta limited tariff benefits as defined in Clause 9 under Rule 21. 
So with that, there are certain restrictions in which we have to do procedurally to go forward with this particular piece of legislation, realizing there are other discussions that will take place before we come to a final conclusion. So in order to allow the House to continue its scheduled business for the day, I would urge members to vote yes on the question of consideration of this resolution so that we can continue on with the 141 amendments that were made in order and then talk about procedurally how to do some others that may be coming down at some other time. I, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back and all time for debate has expired. And the question is, will the House now consider the resolution? Those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the question of consideration is decided in the affirmative. Gentlemen. Parliamentary inquiry, Madam Speaker. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Parliamentary inquiry. From Massachusetts. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, how could I go about amending the resolution such that the amendment that uh, I and Walter, Congressman Walter Jones authored, authored to H.R. 4310 regarding the war in Afghanistan could be made in order? At this point, the amendment could be offered by the gentleman from Utah or a member to whom he yields for that purpose. Uh, Madam Speaker. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be amended to include the McGovern Jones Smith Paul Amendment on Afghanistan. Does the gentleman from Utah yield for a unanimous consent request? No, ma'am. Uh, ma Madam Speaker, further parliamentary inquiry? Yes. Is it true that the rule can be amended on the floor? If the gentleman from Utah offers an amendment or yields for that purpose. Further parliamentary inquiry. Is it true that the gentleman, gentleman will state. Is it true that the gentleman from Utah could yield for the purpose of a unanimous consent request to amend the rule? Yes, that is correct. Uh, further parliamentary inquiry, Madam Speaker. Is it gentleman true, will state. Is it true that the gentleman is continuing to prevent the House from debating and voting on the McGovern Jones Amendment simply because the, the Republican gentleman is leadership not stating is afraid a will pass? Proper parliamentary inquiry. Gentleman from Utah, recognized for one hour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For purposes of debate only, I yield the customary three minutes to the gentleman from, uh, Mass from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, pending which I should yield myself such time as I may consume. During considering of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only. And I further ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revive and extend their remarks. Without objection. Madam Speaker, this resolution provides for a structured rule for the consideration of H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2003. It provides for the consideration of specific amendments that have been made in order pursuant to the rule. I'm actually pleased to stand before the House on this one as well as the underlying base bill, which was approved in rule yesterday and was debated before this, uh, on this floor. It's, it signifies the hard work of the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Mr. McKeon, as well as the ranking member, the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Smith, and a complex of wide-ranging bills that go to the floor for our consideration or issues. One of the things that is so nice about this particular issue, bill, and the relationship of this committee is their tradition of working together across the aisle in a bipartisan manner. It was done again this year in committee, I certainly hope that, that that policy retains itself here on the floor as well. Much has already been said regarding H.R. 4310. This particular rule now allows, 400, now allows uh, amendments to be considered to that. Realizing that every one of the issues that we will be talking about was handled under regular order in a subcommittee hearing with a subcommittee mark, and then a full committee hearing, which lasted for over two days, going way into the early hours of the morning, we, are now, we have now been requested as a Rules Committee to consider 240 additional amendments. At some point in the process, um, we need to stop trying to reinvent the wheel at every level and go on with the work that moves us forward to a product. The Rules Committee, in an effort to try and be as open as possible, made in order 141 of the 240 requests. Of those 141, 49 were Republican, but 63 were Democrat amendments, and 29 were bipartisan amendments. It's going to be an open process, and it's going to be a process that will allow for a wide range of debates, some of which 
and hopefully all of which will in some way be directed to the purpose of this bill, which is to provide authorization for the military defense of this country and provide what our military shape will appear to be. There may be some efforts to try and go with other issues that are tangentially related but are not directly to the core responsibility of this bill, which is to shape the future of our military. But it is a fair rule, and it is a good rule, which makes lots of amendments in, in, in order, and which makes lots of Democrat amendments in order, and bipartisan amendments in order, with also a few Republican amendments in order as well. And with that, as I'm sure we'll have more time to discuss this rule, I would like to reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Utah reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the gentleman from Utah for yielding me the customary 30 minutes, and I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. And, uh, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, let me begin by commending the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Mr. McKean, and the Ranking Member, Mr. Smith of Washington, uh, for their hard work on this uh, bill. Uh, as has been mentioned, these two gentlemen uh, demonstrate that despite strong differences of opinion, they can work together in, uh, in a bipartisan manner, and that is to be commended. Uh, unfortunately, Madam Speaker, uh, the same cannot be said of the Rules Committee, and I strongly oppose this rule. Last night, late at night, the Rules Committee made in order several amendments to the Defense Bill. We have a long list of them here. But many other amendments on important and substantive issues were denied an opportunity for debate. Among those was a bipartisan amendment on Afghanistan, submitted by my Republican colleagues, Congressman Walter Jones and Ron Paul, my Democratic colleague, uh, the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, Congressman Smith of Washington, uh, and myself. And in fact, uh, the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee asked that an amendment he had on Afghanistan be withdrawn so that he could support the amendment that Mr. Jones and I brought before the Rules Committee. In brief, uh, it would have required the President to fulfill his commitments to transition all combat operations to Afghan authority no later than the end of 2013 and complete the transition of all military and security operations by the end of 2014. Anything beyond 2014 should be authorized by Congress. The McGovern, Jones, Smith, Paul amendment would have, been, would have replaced Section 1216 in this bill which retains at least 68,000 troops in Afghanistan until 2015 and then advocates a robust U.S. military presence beyond that date. Madam Speaker, that seems like an important issue that deserves uh, a serious debate. But the Rules Committee said no. They refused to make our amendment in order. And, and why not, Madam Speaker? What is the Republican leadership afraid of? Are they afraid that a bipartisan majority of this House will vote to follow the will of the American people and change our Afghanistan policy? Madam Speaker, we have been at war in Afghanistan since 2001. This is the longest war in American history. By the end of this year, we will have gone into debt to the tune of nearly $500 billion to finance the war in Afghanistan. All of it borrowed money, all of it on the national credit card, not a single penny of it paid for. And that includes the $88.5 billion in this bill. Over 15,000 of our brave servicemen and women have been wounded. And the death toll of our troops in Afghanistan has now reached 1,968. That number continues to grow as U.S. forces receive less cooperation from Pakistan. And they are subject to increasing attacks from, the Afghan, from Afghan government troops serving alongside of them. And the death toll numbers do not include the soaring rates of suicide by our returning war veterans. But the Republican leadership of this House does not think we should debate an amendment that advocates a different approach. That is simply outrageous, uh, Madam Speaker. Every single one of us, every single one of us in this chamber is responsible uh, for putting our brave servicemen and women in harm's way. Uh, and to, to, to disallow an amendment uh, to disallow this kind of debate that would help change our policy, I think is outrageous. Now, I'm glad that the Rules Committee finally, uh, finally, and finally made in order the one Afghanistan amendment submitted by the gentle lady from California, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. This amendment calls for the safe, orderly, and expeditious withdrawal of our forces from Afghanistan, and it will finally allow members of this body to vote on whether it is time to bring all of our troops home right now from Afghanistan. Last night, the chairman of the Rules Committee told me that I should be happy because they were making that one amendment on Afghanistan in order. 
and it was going to receive a whole 20 minutes of debate. 20 minutes for a debate on the war in Afghanistan. Just 10 minutes for those of us who have concerns about the war. Are we really supposed to be happy about that? Are the American people supposed to be happy about it? Poll after poll reveals that a majority of Americans, Democrats, Independents, and Republicans alike now support ending U.S. military operations in Afghanistan and bringing our servicemen and women home. Winding the war down as quickly as possible is a bipartisan issue, Mr. Speaker. It has, been bi it has, it has bipartisan support in this House, and it has been granted just 20 lousy minutes of debate. Well, I'm not happy with that, Mr. Speaker. And I can't imagine that any member of this House thinks that 20 minutes is enough time to debate the life and death issues of the war in Afghanistan. We spent 40 minutes in this House on bills naming post offices. 40 minutes on naming post offices. And that's fine. But the longest war in U.S. history only warrants half of that? Talk about misplaced priorities. As the only amendment on the war in Afghanistan made an order, I urge my colleagues to vote in support of the Lee Amendment. Otherwise, this bill calls for our uniformed men and women to remain in Afghanistan indefinitely. And my colleagues need to be clear on this. Uh, this is a bill that would mandate that our brave men and women in uniform stay there indefinitely. The Rules Committee also denied uh, Congressman Garamendi's amendment to strike the funding to construct an East Coast uh, Star Wars fantasy base. The defense bill provides $100 million in startup money for the East Coast base and to bring it into operation by 2015 will require another projected $5 billion. Just last week, Army General Martin Dempsey, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said the site is not needed. The Pentagon doesn't want it, Mr. Speaker. And I actually think $5 billion is lowballing the cost. A similar base on the West Coast has now cost us upwards of $30 billion. Why shouldn't, shouldn't we have such a debate on, this, on an expensive proposal like that? Or is all the Republican talk about cost-cutting and putting our fiscal house in order as big a fantasy as this silly Star Wars proposal? And where are all these extra billions and billions of dollars coming from, Mr. Speaker? Well, we know where it's coming from. We had that debate just last week. It's coming from programs to help hard-working families. It's coming from the safety net that keeps those families from falling into poverty, especially in these hard times. It's coming from programs to make sure seniors and the working poor can at least put food on the table and take their kids to a doctor when they're sick. SNAP, Medicaid, Meals on Wheels, Medicare, health care for women and children, education, infrastructure. In short, it's taken from programs that are the very lifeblood of our city, states, and our towns. Madam Speaker, this bill costs $642.7 billion. But too many amendments to reduce some of the more outrageous costs in this bill were denied by the Republican Rules Committee. In real terms, defense spending is now more than 20 percent higher than the average Cold War budget and double the amount we were spending a decade ago. Madam Speaker, we have, and we will continue to have, the greatest, strongest military in the face of this earth. But at some point, national security means more than throwing billions of dollars at pie-in-the-sky Star Wars programs that will never actually materialize. It means taking care of our own people. It means educating our children. It means an infrastructure that isn't crumbling around us. It means clean air and clean water and a health care system that works. It means creating jobs so that our local communities can thrive and our veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan can actually find decent work when they return home. These must be our priorities. Madam Speaker, let me conclude by quoting President Dwight Eisenhower in a speech he made in 1953. My quote, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed, end quote. His words resonate with us today. Unfortunately, the Republican leadership of this House refuses to heed them. I urge my colleagues, especially those who are concerned about this war in Afghanistan, uh, vote this rule down. This is an unfair, unfair rule. Uh, it doesn't deserve to go forward. We ought to have a real debate on Afghanistan. Uh, and I hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will stand with me, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Maryland reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Utah. Madam Speaker, as we discuss the amendments that we've made to a bill whose purpose is 